Lynn. Uh, our committee, the Youth Education Cultural Affairs Committee of CB2 is called to order and is being recorded in accordance with the open meetings law. It's our practice to conduct remote meetings with all the committee members' cameras turned on. Public attendees can leave the camera on when they're speaking. I'll let you know topics that uh, are open for comment by community members uh, and the public and so on. If you have questions that fall out of this time, uh, put it in the chat, we try to address, and we're committed to providing access uh, if you need accommodations to contact the district office 72 hours prior, please use plain language, speak at a moderate pace. I'm glad everyone's here. I'm glad I finished that portion. Okay, so that's the welcome and the protocol. So next uh, we will introduce our committee members. So each person will introduce themselves and then call on another member to um, introduce themselves. So I'm Betty Feibush, I'm the chair of the committee and I'm calling on Ellis. Now, uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Ellis Scope. I'm a member of the committee and I am calling on Santia. Good evening, my name is Santia Policia. I am a committee member and board member, and I am calling on Samantha. Hi everyone, my name is Samantha Johnson. I'm a committee member and I am calling on Rachel. I think Rachel's audio is still connecting. Maybe Nick can go next. Good evening, everybody. I'm Nick Ferreira. <clears throat> I'm a committee and board member. Great. Um, Rachel, oh, here you are. Hi. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Rachel, um, committee and board member. Nice to be here. Fabulous. Now, um, We'd like to adopt the agenda. Are there any objections? Seeing none, the agenda is adopted. And the adoption of the previous minutes, uh, they were uh, linked on the agenda. Uh, are there any comments or concerns? Hearing none, the minutes are adopted. If you review them in the next few days and you have a question or concern, please contact the board office. Thank you. Uh, next is the open session, public comment on the agenda. If there's anyone who objects to the agenda. Okay, so uh, we're excited, thank you. So we're excited to have read 718 uh, present the two hour committee. Um, I myself have passed this storefront on Atlantic Avenue, shall I say a zillion times, it's on my route. And I thought, oh, this is nice, but I never really knew what they did. So, I mean, I know they do reading, but um, I am so excited to, to welcome them and hear about them and hear about really how we can make connections to the schools and the population so that whatever openings they have for their services, um, more people will know about. So uh, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for, for having us. We're really happy to be here. Um, I'll just introduce myself and then Annalisa. Yeah. My, my name is Emily Curvin and I'm the founder and executive director of READ 718. And I'm Annalisa Trotman. Um, I'm the program associate at Boreham Hill and the outreach coordinator. Um, so, so yeah, thanks again for having us. We just wanted to um, not take up too much of your time, just a few minutes to uh, explain what we do, who we are, why we're here. Um, so you're right. So just to build awareness um, and uh, well, well, we'll take you through yes. the slides. So awesome. um, let me, can I share my screen and go ahead and start? Great, okay. Um, okay, 
Hold on one sec. Sorry about that. Okay, so so yeah, we are located on um, Atlantic Avenue between Bond and Nevins. We also have a second location in um, bed -Stuy. And since the pandemic, uh, we now have a remote program that we are continuing because we found that it was actually quite effective and um, a way to reach more, more kids who may need our services. So um, our mission and purpose, uh, we are a nonprofit organization and our mission is to help close the literacy gap in Brooklyn and help ensure educational access and equity for all children. And our immediate goal, the thing that we work on very sp specifically and is targeted, um, is for our uh, uh, the, the, the students that we work with to be reading at or above grade level. And our ultimate goal is to make a substantial impact on our participants' lifelong education and life outcomes by strengthening their fundamental reading skills. Um, so, you know, here, here in Brooklyn, there are many, many, many children who are reading below grade level or even far below grade level. And so our mission is to provide one-to-one -one instruction and help them reach grade level or beyond. Um, so how do we do that? We provide one-to-one -one and small group reading instruction, um, evidence-based reading instruction, I should add, to children who are reading below grade level and who are from low-income households. Um, we specifically, our, our core program is for third through eighth graders. So we work with children who have, are sort of past that learning to read stage, um, but who are still struggling with some of those foundational reading skills. Um, we do this in our two centers, Borum Hill and Bed-Stuy, as well as remotely. Um, and it is very low cost to our families. Um, the most a family would pay would be $100 for 10 weeks of one-to-one -one instruction, and that's for twice a week for an hour and 15 minutes. So $100 for over 20 sessions of one-to-one -one instruction, and as low as they pay nothing. Um, we work on a sliding scale, uh, 100 being the top of the scale, and the parents or families choose what to pay. Um, so we also, we recruit and train community volunteers. So all of our one-to-one -one instruction is um, implemented by volunteer tutors. Um, we currently have, um, right now, this year we will have trained and engaged over 200 volunteers, but currently um, we have over 120. And uh, like I said, we provide training to all of our volunteers as well as ongoing support as they're working with the children. So we have people who you, you don't need to be a reading instructor um, or, or a teacher to do this work. Um, you just have to have uh, you know, excellent communication skills as well as a real desire um, to, to learn and to do this work. Um, we uh, believe in providing um, you know, high quality instruction, as well as building positive relationships between the adults and the children. That's something we really stress. Um, and we also provide free educational workshops that are open to the entire community. Um, usually it's our volunteers and the families of our participants that attend, but it's uh, absolutely open to anyone in the community, our educational workshops. And we hold in each location about four per year. And they their topics range, I mean, they're all kind of like educational topics, but they range from how to support your child, uh, your child's reading at home. We have one coming up on how to support your child's ex executive functioning skills at home. Um, we had one on uh, how trauma impacts learning um, with a social worker that was our that last cycle. So there's a wide range of topics. Um, and like I said, they're free and anyone can join. Um, so I'm going to, or this, this one's mm -hmm. still me. Okay. So who are the participants? Um, like I said, we, uh, any child who is eligible um, can attend and eligibility is that they are reading below grade level. So we're not an enrichment program. We are um, an intervention program. 
um, and they are from low income house, low income households. So they can be anywhere from New York City, but the vast majority of the kids we serve are here in Brooklyn. Um, uh, and here's just the breakdown of some demographics of the children that we serve. Um, and approximately 50% of the, the children have IEPs um, or some, some kind of a learning difference. Okay, so Annalisa will tell you a little bit about uh, our programs. Yeah, so we have a number of programs that run all year long. Um, so the fall, winter, and spring, and also um, an abbreviated program in the summertime. Um, so uh, our main program is our READ 718 after school program. Um, and that is for students who are in grades three through eight. They come in after school twice a week for about an hour and 15 minutes or so at a time um, to uh, focus on filling in the skill gaps and building um, on their reading instruction. Um, then we also have uh, that same program on Zoom through Read 718 Remote. Uh, we have a Saturday reading room program, and that's for students in grades one and two um, who are having um, trouble decoding with their phonics skills. Uh, and that's a small group program. We have no, uh, it's no more than eight students at a time. And then we also have a read up program. Um, and that's uh, three students, um, and our focus there are students who uh, have a dyslexia diagnosis or um, based on, you know, working with them, talking to their teachers, report cards, um, talking to their parents, uh, where they need more um, targeted and structured instruction. Uh, during the summertime, we have three programs that run. Uh, the summer reading room basically mirrors our after-school program, so it's twice a week, uh, I think it's from four to five and five to six this summer, um, two days a week uh, and for grades three through eight. Then we have a program called Rising Readers um, and that's for students who are going into the third grade in the fall and they need more heavy phonics and decoding instruction. And then we have something called Word Up which kind of mirrors our Read Up program um, and that's for fourth and fifth graders who need more support with decoding. There we go. And we, we will give you time for questions. Uh, yes. just that. Um, and like Emily said, we have two in-person locations. Um, the one that we're in right now is Borum Hill. It's on Atlantic and Bond. Um, and then our location in Bed-Stuy is on Malcolm X and Bainbridge. And uh, our Read 718 remote is on Zoom. Um, so our volunteers, um, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the help of our volunteers. Um, and they are typically just members of the community, people walking by, um, you know, every location is a storefront. So people often come in, they don't know what we do, who we are, are we a bookstore? Are, you know, what are we? They don't know. And so um, we've uh, had a lot of people just walking by that uh, were interested after we explained what we do. Uh, people refer their friends. Some people are educators. A lot of people are not. Um, and so we just require that um, our volunteers are at least 18 years um, old. They have at least a high school diploma. They can commit to two days per week at the designated times. Um, if they do have experience with children, that's definitely a plus. Um, and we want them to, you know, help foster this positive, collaborative environment that we promote um, because you know, doing something that's difficult um, is very vulnerable and it's scary. And we want kids to to be confident when they come here when uh, as they're working with their tutors. So um, positivity is, is definitely a plus. Um, we also take our onboarding very seriously. So we require a background check. Um, applicants have to provide two references. Uh, they attend a 20 minute orientation as well as a three hour training. Um, and then we have other opportunities for them to continue um, to gain more training through Zoom hangouts um, and then just various workshops that Emily talked about. And I think that's okay. And quickly back to me. So um, the things that that you know we're, we're letting you guys know about that you can if if you can spread the word for us, we, that would be fantastic. Um, but people can obviously register a child. So a child who meets our eligibility requirements, um, we ask families just to register online, and then we're in touch with them. Um, there is often, to be totally honest, there is often um, a wait list for our programs, um, but 
we always encourage families to apply. Don't wait because once they get on the wait list, um, you know, often stuff does come up and can come up very quickly. Um, and of course, it's first come, first serve. So once they're on the wait list, the sooner the better. Um, so register a child, or of course, we are always looking for fantastic volunteers. Um, we we really pride ourselves on having a really wonderful team of volunteers. Um, and, and for the most part, they, they really do find it to be a meaningful and rewarding experience. Um, and so we encourage people who either have some extra time, who maybe are interested in becoming an educator, certainly retired educators, we could see a lot of those. Um, but really, it's, it's anyone who is interested and, and feels that they're able to do this, we welcome them. Um, and of course, we're always looking for donations as well. Um, we uh, we we survive by uh, funding from individual donors as well as mostly private foundations and corporations. Um, and for more information, you can certainly go to our website uh, where there's all of this and more um, and some videos, et cetera. So here is our contact information. I'm just emily at read718.org. I totally encourage you to reach out. This is Annalisa at read718.org. Um, you know, website, Instagram, if you do that. And uh, we welcome any questions that you might have. And I will stop my share. But um, yeah, so yeah. That, that's it. Thank you so much. Um, so first, I would like to call on any committee members who have questions. Seeing none. We did such uh, a Ellis, we see <laughs> Ellis. Okay. Ellis, you're, yeah. Thank you. Um, I couldn't find the little hand button so fast, <laughs> uh, but here I am. Um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, in the news, we have been hearing about a lot of the young people um, that are coming new in our schools now. They're, you know, the, the immigrants who are new and who are coming in a rather large wave. And I wonder if you have experience supporting those young people who come to our schools. And a connected question, I guess, is, um, um, kind of your experience and your capacity uh, to deal with English language learners. And I have a, another, not quite connected, but I'll just put it out there right now. Um, you are serving 50% uh, of students with IEPs. And I'm wondering um, if or how uh, you get access to at least a part of the document that speaks to how the students are would be best served by you know by what what approach to learning reading and writing would be best for them. So it's the three questions: the 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 new immigrant children, the ELLs, and and uh, access or not to uh, the IEPs. Sure, thank you. Great, great for... question, Ellis. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your questions and I'll, I'll try to answer them. As far as um, the new, new immigrants, to, to be honest, we have, we have, not, um, we have not worked with them uh, that are, are you know, super, super new to the, mm -hmm. to the country. As far as EL, um, English language learners, we do have quite a few students who are English language learners. Um, and it is, you know, all of the instruction that we do is in English. Um, and surprisingly, when you are teaching someone uh, to read, uh, it, it, there's a lot of similarities in teaching someone who is learning English with someone who is also learning to read. Um, so it's the, the vast majority of the students that we see um, do speak English, often their families or the, the, it may be a second language for them, but they are fluent in English. Um, but it is, you know, but we do have experience with English language learners and it's something, again, everything is 
individualized here. Mm -hmm. And so it is really working with the specific tutor and the specific child and what their needs are. That's kind of the, that's kind of the, the, you know, privilege that we have in, in working with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, as far as the third question, how do we get access? Oh yeah, access to the IEPs. So we just we have relationships with the families, and we ask them if they are open to to sharing the IEP. And for you know, ninety five percent of the time they are, and um, we that's how that's how we get the IEP, and and we read it and do our best to serve that child. And and sometimes I'll just add. Sometimes we. Um, we get the uh, contact information for uh, the teachers at the student school. And so we can email them, we'll set up um, Zoom meetings with them um, just to collaborate to see like what's going on in school, how we can also um, help to use different strategies um, so that the student is seeing things that are consistent. Um, so we have a partnerships with the families, partnerships with the, the teachers um, as much as, as possible. Okay, um, thank you. I, I do have two more questions. So Betty, sure. I don't know, maybe you want to well, post some other people first. We have uh, <laughs> Melinda Rasco, uh, her hand is up. Yes, hi, thank you both for meeting with us today. Um, great present presentation as well. So uh, can you highlight for us some of your success rates as well as the population that you work with uh, primarily? Uh, the demographics of students. Are they black, indigenous students of color? Um, which grades, where do they live? When they come to your program, um, where are they starting? Are they reading on grade level? Are they not? So if you could just provide us with that overview and then talk about your success rates within that. Sure. Um, so, so our core after school program is for third through eighth graders. Um, we do have a Saturday program that's for first and second graders, but that's just once a week. Our, really, our core program and focus is third through eighth grade. So it's children who are sort of past that learning to read phase, but many of them are still learning, <laughs> learning to read um, and, you know, and who are reading below grade level. Um, all of the children that we work with are from low or very low income um, households. Um, and as far as the... Uh, uh, where they come from, um, you know, I don't have the exact numbers. I, I wish I did. I mean, I do somewhere. I just don't have it here. Um, but we really, they really do come from all over Brooklyn. But obviously in our centers, the one we have one in Bed-Stuy, one in Borum Hill, we see a lot of kids in the surrounding um, immediate neighborhoods and surrounding schools. But also we have many kids who travel to our centers as well by subway, bus, um, or car, uh, et cetera. So we, so we do see kids from, from all over Brooklyn. And then of course, in our remote program, um, kids do it from home. So that too, we had a few kids in the Bronx or, you know, Manhattan, uh, in, in, in different boroughs even. Um, so, oh, and then as far as the demographics, I can go back to my slide. Hold on one sec. Ah, well, it's demographics and success rates as well. Yeah, and then the success rates. So, um, oh gosh, hold on. I'm trying to. Okay, so currently, how do I get back to the Zoom now? <laughs> Maybe escape. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to look at my slides and you guys Maybe. at the same time. I'll do it in a second. But um, so, like, currently, 55% of our students are Black or African American. 36%. Um, are Hispanic or Latinx, 5% are Arab American, 3% are Asian American, and about 50%, um, like I said, have uh, IEPs. Um, so that's a general breakdown of those demographics. And then as far as um, our success rates, and, and also you asked when the kids come to us where they are, um, you know, at what level they're coming. Like I said, they're all below grade level, but we serve a wide range. So we might see a seventh grader who is on a first grade level, or we might see a fifth grader who just needs a little bit of support and is on a, you know, fourth grade level. Um, as if they are based on teacher reports, parent reports, as well as the reading assessment that we do at their intake, um, we just determine that they are reading below grade level. So again, 
it's it really depends on the child when they come to us where they are and we really work on an individual basis there um as far as our success rates go um about it, it, let's see it's like over 80 percent of our kids move up at least one fount of reading level most of them read up uh, move up one and a half levels per cycle so over the course of the school year it's on average they move up about a year and a half. So in other words, if it's a 10 month school year, the majority of our kids will move up a year and a half worth of reading level. Does that make sense? It doesn't always to somebody who's not. Mm -hmm. No, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so they're moving at, you know, they're moving. And, and this is often for kids who have been sort of stagnant for a while and haven't made a lot of movement and they're sort of catching up and then a little bit more. Thank you. Sure. Did, Ellis, did you have another question before? Um, oh, and Nick has a question. Okay, Nick, do you want to go and then Ellis and then I'll, okay. Sure, Nick. sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for, for the work you're doing. Uh, sure. It's extreme, extremely important. Uh, I think it may be a slight follow-up question would be is there are there any specific assessments you know you're using and or program you did mention evidence based maybe a research based so I was just yeah. curious if you know assessments and or you know curriculum or program and i was wondering you definitely highlighted some phonics and decoding mm -hmm. were, were there any other sort of specific you know reading uh skills that you that you find yourself targeting Sure. Should I answer? Yeah, okay. I can do the the thing that they're, we're targeting and okay. and the assessment if you want. Okay, go yeah. for it. Um, so typically when students come in, we start with um, an initial assessment. The initial assessment is uh, an uh, an FNP assessment. Um, we only use FNP to assess the students just to standardize um, when they start. And then at the end of the 10 week cycle to see how much progress they make. Um, and so that is focused on um, phonics and decoding as well as comprehension. Um, and then from there, we customize their curriculum. And so when students come in, there are three parts to their session. The first part is a word study component. And that is where um, it's gonna target the phonics. It's gonna target the sounds. It's gonna target the blending. Um, whatever um, whatever areas they need to focus on based on that initial assessment. Um, then that's maybe about 20 to 25 minutes. Then uh, for about 30 minutes is strictly reading comprehension where the student is reading um, at the instructional level that we found based on their assessment with their tutor. Um, and then they're, we're working on monitoring their comprehension. Um, that's typically the first unit that students uh, come in and, and we target um, just so that they can practice um, you know, retelling the stories or, um, you know, if there are words that they don't understand or they're not um, able to see with automaticity that the tutor is helping them to stop, to break it down, to sound it out, just teaching those really core foundational skills. Um, and then the last part is a read aloud. And that's about 20 to 25 minutes or so um, where the tutor is reading to the student. Um, so reading comprehension, student is reading to the tutor read aloud, tutor is reading to the student. Um, and that's, we want uh, students to hear what a competent fluent reader sounds like. Um, and so, you know, reading with intonation, reading with expression, um, so that the student hears, like they're, sees that there are different components of reading, um, but just to hear um, what fluency sounds like, because often um, kid, kids may not be hearing that. Um, and yes. also to access grade level text. Yes, and to access grade level text. Yes, so their reading comprehension is where they're instructional, um, and then their the read aloud part um, is can, typically at a higher level or their grade level. Um, and then I think there's like more curriculum, maybe questions that you. Yeah, have. just just to add to that, the um, so that, so we do sort of what you probably have heard this thrown around a lot lately, but the science of reading, which basically focuses on. Um, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. And so those are sort of the five areas 
that we really try to incorporate into all of our lessons. So of course, for some children, if they are just learning to read and are still working on like letter sound correspondence, their instruction is gonna be more heavy in that um, decoding work and in that word study work that Annalise just uh, talked about. And so they'll probably spend a little more time. But we also might have a middle schooler who where the decoding and phonics is, is pretty, is pretty good, um, pretty solid. That may not be an area that they really need to focus on. And theirs really might be more fluency, vocabulary and comprehension. And so in that case for that, that child, um, the word study work might be more uh, vocabulary work instead of decoding work. And then the reading with the tutor, you know, reading aloud to the tutor, they'd be working more on comprehension and fluency. So all of the kids do all of those components, but it might, it looks slightly different depending on the child's particular needs. Mm -hmm. And as far as programs that we use for, um, that are evidence-based, for the word study, we use Explode the Code, Mega Words, and Words Their Way. Those are the three programs that we use. Um, and then the comprehension um, and fluency strategies we use are also evidence-based, but we pull from a variety of programs and have sort of created our own units that, that work best uh, for, for our purposes and, and with our tutors. So um, it's a little bit of a little bit of a hodgepodge, but with uh, but with but very structured at the same time. Yeah. I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, that's it's. Uh, I, I do literacy is my training. I, I really. I was yeah. wondering if there was flexibility. You know, you had. I heard the time frames, and I was just wondering. So super happy to hear that there's flexibility, um, depending on it. So very short question. Just curious. Is sight words at all? Does it come up? Is it? Is oh it yeah. A... Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, especially with those kids who are are still. You know, that's. Uh, mm -hmm. an issue we we mm -hmm. you know we have the sight word uh flashcards and and they are working on that as well too yeah thank you you sound like you did amazing work appreciate it sure i think ellis had her hand again and then i have a question if or two but yeah ellis uh first of all i want to thank melinda and nick who helped me get rid of by using their <laughs> questions helped me get rid of one of mine so thank you both for that. And uh, one remaining question I have is you mentioned that families are expected to register online. Mm -hmm. And that is just something that I'm extremely Good. concerned about because being able to get online to A, have a device and B, have reliable internet access that is just not available to everybody. And I know that your other way of recruitment is by people walking by, but I think um, I am concerned that there may still be other families um, that that really might like this service, might even prefer, you know, might even want this service. But I, you know, how would they learn about it and how without internet access, would they be able to do that? And I'm particularly thinking of like um, elderly uh, family members who are taking care of younger children who just don't have that capacity to just like gather up everybody and walk down to Atlantic or walk down to Malcolm X Boulevard. So that's my question. That was my last question. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great question. And, um, and it's true that the majority of our families do register online. However, and we've done this many, many times, um, families, if they call, we will register for them. We'll talk them through it and we will fill out the application for them. They also, if they come by, we have a paper and pencil application or we can also fill that out for them, um, you know, right then and there. And often we have um, teachers who do the application for the families. If a teacher is referring a child, they will often fill it out and um, and sort of be the, the point person uh, for that when that happens. Um, as far as you know, reaching everyone, that's something we want to do more of. Um, but we, you know, all I can say to that is we welcome families to come in. We will help them register, or like I said, they can also certainly call, and and um, we will help them through that process. So thank you. 
Yeah. Sure. Uh, I see Mel Melinda, you have your hand. Is that a new question or is that? It is It is a new question, but Samantha can go since uh, they didn't ask a question. And then I'll ask. Okay. That sounds good to me. Sam, are you on? Yes, I am. Thank you, Melinda. Um, and thank you both for presenting. I had a question in regards to individuals with disabilities. Um, have you had um, any type of success in converting some of the literature into Braille um, and or using other forms of technology um, like Zoom text um, to help assist individuals with low vision or have you seen any type of trend with that? Um, great question. And um, to be completely honest, no, that is, that's not something that we have, have no. done. Um, it, it's, I mean, it, it's, it hasn't come yeah. up for us yeah. really, but it, that doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's a, yeah. a good idea and important, but it's, it's not something that we currently have. Thank you. Good question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So I think we have May Linda. Yes, thanks again. So um, according to the New York Times, and I'll share the article that I'm that I'm referring to in a moment, half of the children in grades three through eight fail their reading tests. And um, New York City, our chancellor is looking to uh, change the curriculum and the approach to that, uh, to change that. I'm gonna share the article in a moment. Um, I wanted to know, what would your recommendation be since you're in this space? Obviously, I'm sure you would say, come join our program. <laughs> but aside from that, or in addition to that, um, how can we remedy that as a city? Because grades uh, three, to eight, three through eight are, are pivotal. And if our students can't read, then they can't comprehend. And if they can't comprehend, then it, it, it impacts other subjects. So reading, comprehension, um, correlations and inferences, that's all important in reading. Um, and I wanna be sure that we remedy this. So what uh, solutions, um, evidence-based solutions do you have in yeah. addition to joining your program? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I mean, our program exists because um, you know, because there are so many children here who need that extra support. And we wanted to, we, by the way, I didn't, I don't think I said this, but, but we've been here now eight years. Um, and we, it was, I founded it because I wanted to provide that kind of, uh, one-to-one -one high quality tutoring, um, experience, because I know that that, that really can be very powerful and, and can be really effective. Um, and it's, it was because so many children who cannot otherwise afford one-to-one -one tutoring um, are, you know, really struggling and are, are getting older and not getting the support they need. Um, so, so that's why we exist. As far as the city, I'm certainly not going to pretend to have all the answers, um, but I am really uh, excited by the fact that literacy is now, you know, finally um, really paying some close attention to these numbers and recognizing the inequities that exist and that's just simply not okay. Um, and I'm excited uh, that the chancellor and the mayor are um, going to be requiring you know, elementary, uh, elementary uh, schools to be providing that um, science-based mm -hmm. phonics. Uh, that found those foundational skills. Phonics has been de-emphasized for the last 20 or 25 years. Um, and it has not been, uh, and that's been unfortunate. There've been a lot of other wonderful things um, that have been happening, but having that uh, strong foundation in phonics will serve kids and their reading for the rest of, of their reading lives. However, I don't want to, um, I wanna make sure that, or I will say that I would wanna make sure that uh, certainly phonics is not the only thing. And it's certainly not where, where uh, it doesn't stop there, right? Kids still need access to excellent literature. Um, they still need to be working on comprehension and fluency and vocabulary, building their background knowledge and all of those things. But I do think that a, a strong foundation in phonics and making sure that by third grade, kids are really comfortable decoding words um, is, is going to hopefully uh, make an impact. Um, though we also recognize, you know, change takes time. Yeah. And uh, 
We'll see. Thank you. Uh, Sam, is your hand up again or is that the previous hand? It's a new question hand. <laughs> a new question. Uh, new question, yes. please. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so I have a question in regards to funding. You may have already tapped on this, but I just wanted to get clarity. Um, how, what are your funding sources? Are you foundation based? Are you getting additional funding from the Department of Education? Um, and then also, are you working collaboratively with other partners who are doing similar type of work to try to maintain um, stability within your um, organization? Yeah, great. Those are great questions. Um, as far as our funding goes, we don't, we do not get any um, city or Department of Ed funding. Um, we really do operate pretty independently. Um, we it, are the majority of our funding comes from private foundations, some corporations, as well as individual donors. We have events, fundraising events, um, et cetera. So. We used to get a little bit of discretionary funds um, from the council member mm -hmm. uh, in the past year. We, we didn't apply for that, but um, but it was a very, very tiny bit of our budget. Uh, so, so yeah, that that's private foundations, corporations, and individual donors. Um, and as far as partnering with other organizations, we do have a few small partnerships um, with other organizations that, you know, current and in the past, um, but mostly, but mostly we're really working pretty independently, to be honest. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, so I have a few questions. So one, you, you talked a little bit about how children come to your program through walking by or an application online or in person. Going back further, then how do people hear of you? And do you make specific visits or outreaches to either the neighboring schools that are in walking distance to your um, storefronts or to the district offices? That's something that we can help you connect with if that is one of your goals. Great, thank you. Do you wanna answer that question? Yeah, Lisa? yeah, we, um, we try to just create awareness wherever we can. Um, so we have some connections with parent coordinators at schools. Um, you know, we, we have brochures that we'll drop off. We'll email them whenever we have an, an event, whenever there's a new cycle starting. Um, we do have partnerships with um, bookstores in the area, like Books Are Magic. Um, I forget what the other one is. Um, Greenlight. Yeah, green light. Um, and sometimes they'll put uh, workshops that we're doing um, in their in their newsletters. Um, we do tabling libraries. libraries. Um, sometimes we just walk around the neighborhood and hand out flyers, especially when we're looking for volunteers, um, just so people know about us, because, you know, I feel like awareness is the first step. Um, and then we try to table at uh, colleges, at community service fairs. Um, we partner with like the Atlantic Block Association. Um, and I mean, we're really just always looking for places to just spaces to, to let people know that this program exists, but also um, we do provide opportunities for the community so that we want people to um, take advantage of that. Um, so yeah, we're, we're always looking for, um, for partnerships. We're always looking for, um, yeah, places to connect with, with others okay. who are doing so if you're interested in more like formal relationship with the district, we can help you um, connect you with, uh, you're in district 15, but very close to district 13. In mm -hmm. your bed style office, are you physically in district 16? Physically in 16. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, we don't, we, have a strong relationship with district 13 and a relationship with 15 so you know we can talk offline if Great. that would be helpful but then the flip side of that is okay getting the community awareness getting the children um referred assessing them and doing the work my next question i guess it's a little hard to get it out but teaching reading is a very complex activity and we read and we know from teacher friends 
that many teachers don't really know how to teach reading well. And it takes a long time to learn the craft and the science of teaching reading. So you're recruiting volunteers. You said some of them might be retired teachers, some of them might be future teachers, community volunteers. How do you get people up and running so quickly? And mm -hmm. then this is very tailored. This tutoring is very tailored to the specific children. Like mm -hmm. if I were to tutor, how would I know what the next lesson should be or what I as a tutor should be focusing on? Because clearly you want, you know, high quality uh, work and outcomes. And it's through the tutor, the one-to-one -one, uh, yeah. work. So can you talk a little bit about how you train the tutor and support the tutor and give them more curriculum of what they need, like check in yeah. with them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so as Annalisa said, um, well, first we have just a, like a 20 minute orientation. So we make sure that people who have applied to be volunteers understand what they're getting into. <laughs> so um, we often say like, this is not just reading alongside a child. It is reading instruction. And we want to make sure that um, our two, you know, our volunteers are aware of that and, and want to do that. Um, so that's what the 20 minute orientation sort of is. And then once they decide to move forward and we do the screening, um, then they come to a three hour training before they would start working with the child. And that's where we really, um, you know, talk about an overview of sort of reading and reading research. And then as well as specifics about our curriculum and how we do things here at READ 718, as well as about uh, relationship building and working with a child. So that, you know, kind of gives them a, a broad and somewhat detailed um, overview. Then once they start tutoring, we send them a profile of the child um, that we've written based on the child's uh, assessment and intake with an interview with the parent. Um, and then we provide their lesson plans. So staff like Annalisa mm -hmm. and others, they're creating the 10 week lesson plan. And it's actually updated week to week mm -hmm. as the child is making progress, mm -hmm. um, a 10 week lesson plan. So when the tutor comes in to our center or if they're remote, when they log on, they have the lesson plan in front of them. Um, so they don't need to know, they don't need to know what the next step is. They just need to be able, trained enough to read the plan and interpret the plan and implement it. Um, so, so, and in person, it's really easy to support the volunteers because our staff is always here and they're stopping in, they're checking in, how's it going? The, the, they write a weekly tutor report. So, um, you know, they're, they're in constant communication with the tutors. Um, and remotely it's a little trickier because obviously uh you know our staff is not seeing them but there is a lot of communication uh remotely as well including the tutor reports and a back and forth there and we also have tutor hangouts on zoom and that's just um sort of like office hours i guess mm -hmm. it's where staff is available for any tutor both in person and remote um, to sign on to Zoom. They happen every single week to ask questions, share ideas, um, you know, complain <laughs> or <laughs> talk about their successes or whatever it is. Um, so, so we really try to support our volunteers because as you said, we know that teaching reading is really complicated. Um, and so we try to provide them um, with as much support as we can so that they're comfortable and also, of course, most importantly, so they're really serving the child. Thank you. I have one more question. Um, your storefronts are specific, you know, in specific areas. So, you know, five, 10 blocks around, you know, people walk. I know some of our district, for example, is near Wegmans. It's not really walkable to Atlantic Avenue or to Bed Stuy. Do you ever help or are you in the do you have the capacity to help families arrange transportation or carpooling or mm -hmm. hiring someone to walk them or any way to get the kid to the service? 
Yeah, that is, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. And I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but we, we do have um, for a few schools that are very close by, but the children are too young to walk on their own. We do have staff pick up from those schools and, and walk them to our center. But for, for children who live um, farther away, and aren't able, we don't, we're not able to arrange transportation. In that case, um, often they do participate in our remote program, um, if that's the case. Uh, and we are, we are working to, it, it didn't happen this spring like we had hoped, but working to work, uh, partner with specific schools so that we can, that kids can be at school after school, log on to their, to the computer um, or tablet, and then we have our remote tutors working with them while they're at school. So that's something that we haven't done yet, but that we are working towards doing. Um, but but unfortunately, we really don't have uh, the capacity, you know, yeah. to, to get the transportation for kids who who don't you know live near us or go to school near us. So if we could connect you to some schools, maybe that are uh, further away, but you know, in our district and in district 13 you would be able to explain to them how a child in their after school program could log on yes yeah if you could send us a one pager about that like about your program and how that's done i think we could facilitate well, that yeah and just and just to be clear um we we do have some kids who are currently in after school programs um who log on you know, with their remote tutor. Um, and, but honestly, that's not, it's not like an, that's not like an official program. <laughs> that's just something that we've worked out with the school and the family and our, and our tutor. Uh, what I was sort of talking about is wanting to have a more formal partnership with a school where say they have 10 to 15 of their kids in a classroom after school, all of whom would be logging on mm -hmm. with our tutors. So they're sort of like two, two slightly different things. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, if that's something you'd like help, you know, facilitating a connection to a school, we could help with that. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. I see a hand. Is that Taya? I know a rare hand from Taya. Um, thank you both so much for being here and for the work. And we know that, of course, um, a nonprofit cannot be all things to all people, but you guys are doing great work. I know that um, volunteers have had really positive experiences with your group. Um, I have three questions. Sure. Do you work at all with book bodega? Yes, we do. Great, because yeah. they seem to be everywhere and, and you guys just seem like you have so many synergies. Um, I was also wondering, second question was what you mentioned that um, you have an, a pretty lengthy waiting list. And I was wondering what is driving that waiting list? Is it vol lack of volunteers? Is it staffing capacity? Is it funding or something else? Um, it's it's mostly volunteers and staffing. So it's an okay. space, honestly. So it's we are we're full in our bedstay um space wise in our Bed-Stuy and Borough Hill locations. And, and we do work in 10 week cycles. So kids can stay with us as long as they need us. So we say 10 week cycles, but it's not like they're done after 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the, the 10 week cycles are really more for the volunteers because the majority of our kids stay for at least a full school year mm -hmm. or three cycles. Um, the 10 week cycles are for volunteers, but actually most of our volunteers stay longer than 10 weeks too. Um, but uh, the wait list is mostly because, yeah, it's all one to one, right? And so for every child, every child we take, we need a volunteer. Um, and we have, we currently are serving about 50 children in our remote program. We have 38 in our after, 37 in our after school in Borum Hill and about 30 in bed -Stuy. And that's just in the after-school program. There, we have, as we said at the beginning, there are a couple of other programs, Saturday, et cetera, and that, that doesn't include those. But um, for our remote program specifically, we were trying to grow to reach more children. Uh, right. And 
And, and that is a volunteer issue. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to really want to do a big push to recruit more remote volunteers because that's where obviously space is not an issue. Um, and so we can, we can easily take more children since we don't need to have space for them. Um, and then, oh, and also staffing, yes. Yeah. So for about every 25 children that we take, we need a staff member who is coordinating the volunteers, the families, the lesson plans, mm -hmm. the assessments, mm -hmm. and all of the things that, um, you know, it Excellent. takes to, yeah. to manage. So it's, so it's a little bit of staffing and volunteers is the, uh, you know, is the bottleneck, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the truth is, is we, we are, we we hope to serve as many children as we possibly can because we know there are so many children who need it. And yet we really are a program that is um, based on the individual and serving the individual. So we think about it less in terms of like, we're serving thousands of kids and more about the um, the quality and the impact we can have on the, on the individuals that we work with. Um, you actually anticipated my next question because I was wondering what your remote capacity was relative to your in-person capacity. I'm not surprised to hear that you have, what, two-thirds more in remote. Um, mm -hmm. We have had, the community board has had the same growth in participation. Um, so then I just, I, I would just um, repeat Betty's offer slightly modified. So there are 18 community boards in Brooklyn Mm -hmm. uh, or community districts, excuse me, in Brooklyn, and the district managers meet together once a month. And I know that if you were to put together <laughs> a square Instagram ready image, um, they would certainly share that. I don't know if each of the offices would have the capacity to create that for you, but if you create yeah. one, I can get it to all of the community boards. That would be, be fantastic. Awesome. Thank yes, you. we will do that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I see a hand. Oh, that's clapping from my Linda. Is that a clap or yes, a clap? that is clapping. I'm I'm happy for them. <laughs> Thanks, Taya. <laughs> Thanks, <Linda>. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh hearing oh no more questions. Ellis, is that a hand or a clap? I can't see. I just, um, uh, you know, I it just starting to hit me now. Otherwise, I would have asked it earlier. Um you uh, and maybe this is my public school background. I know that in public schools, the people who have direct contact with children, which is everybody, has to be fingerprinted. Mm -hmm. And now I really couldn't care less if somebody's been arrested before, but I do care what they were arrested for. <laughs> and so I am right because kids are vulnerable mm -hmm. and more vulnerable than you know. And so um, I'm wondering what your policy is around fingerprinting staff and those volunteers that have direct contact with children. I'm actually not so worried about the remote, right? Because remote is remote. Well, no, actually I should be worried about that too. That what I know in my yeah. So yeah. It just, if you will clarify that because I am sitting here now and it's getting to be like a bigger and bigger concern for me. Thank you. Yeah, I, I that's a great question. Um, we, so before the pandemic, we had all of our volunteers fingerprinted at the DOE um, through NYC service. Um, during, during the pandemic, when we were all fully remote and could no longer do that, we started working with um, a company called Good Hire that runs background checks online. You know, they put in their social security number. Mm -hmm. um, it's much easier and less expensive than having them fingerprinted um, at the DOE. So since we've been back in person, we've continued just working with good hire. So everybody does the full background check. Um, we also get two references mm -hmm. and we also have their application and, and meet with them. Um, so they are background checked, but they are no longer fingerprinted at the DOE. Um, mostly just because it was, uh, it, it's it, like, a, it was kind of expensive and it was challenging. So they have to get there at, you know, a certain time. And um, we found that, you know, much easier doing it online. And because they're not actually in schools with kids, 
um, they're not required to be fingerprinted. But we have the same concern you do, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to make sure that um, that they, you know, that they are background checked. And then for our in-person program, you know, we have staff here that that is can see everyone pretty much at all times. Um, and for a remote, we do ask that the parents doesn't always happen, but we ask that the parents are in earshot of their child's um, sessions, sessions yeah. you know, when they're at home and, and to help monitor those. And then we do check in, we, in the Zoom, we have staff comes and checks in and listens in on sessions periodically, just to make sure that everything is, is going smoothly. So far, we haven't had any issues, mm -hmm. knock on wood, that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that continues. Thank you so much for this very uh, comprehensive and thoughtful uh, presentation. And there are several areas of follow-up. And you're welcome, of course, to come back to our committee at any time. You're welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting or go off and make more lesson plans for the children or <laughs> have dinner with your friends and family. So thank you. We want to really thank you so much for uh, for having us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. okay. So, so now I'd like to move into the chair's report. And as part of the chair's report, uh, I'm going to ask if Sam could give us a very brief update of the Madison Boys and Girls Club because she's in the community and uh, actively uh, working with community stakeholders. Can you bring us up to, up to date, Sam? Yeah, um, hopefully everyone can hear me. So uh, there was a meeting on the 4th of May um, held by council member Hudson to speak about what we all know about the closing of the Boys and Girls Club in addition to what is next. Um, so there was the representatives from the Navy Club, the Boys and Girls uh, Club as well, but ultimately it boiled down to the council member mentioning that there will be sessions for the young people virtually, in addition to her having Saturday, excuse me, Friday and our Saturday programming every Friday during the summer to help extend services and programs for young people. Um, the Boys and Girls Club has agreed to work with the neighboring schools. That would be PS uh, 67, 307, 287, and I believe, yeah, 307, 287, 67. Um, so those neighboring schools, there hasn't been any conversation in regards to the local cornerstones. They have not been mentioned um, to do programming, but they were one was on the call, Ingersoll Community Center was on a call to mention that they also have opportunities for space for the young people if needed. The three schools that have been mentioned were about 30 young people that will be occupying that space. Uh, 287 just got approved for the usage of the summer camp license and the other schools are still negotiating with DYCD and the Board of Education to extend uh, summer camp programming. Um, and that's where we're kind of falling as far as what programming services would be for the young people. Um, it's still scheduled to date for the closing to be on the 27th of June. Thank you for the update. I appreciate it. And please continue to keep us updated. Uh, you will do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, I understand that Ellis went to the Brooklyn Paramount Theater at LIU today or this week or yeah we do cultural things other I than went, education. I, yes yes I got to go on another uh, Yekka field trip and mm -hmm. it was um it was terrific I'm not very good I did not take notes to prepare to speak to you tonight so I'm missing a couple of details that's not my thing uh, Just one but, or two sentences is fine. It's... Oh, okay, good. I can do that. So uh, apparently at LIU, uh, they have they are working with an organization that is refurbishing the LIU theater, and they're doing and to make that a uh, a venue um, for 
for really great stuff to come to New York, like to, you know, to have like people come and sing and do concerts and that kind of thing. It was the, the thing that was so impressive to me was that um, the theater is being refurbished and, um, and, and repaired back to, back to its former glory while also being completely updated and making it modern. It is uh, a real asset for our community. I am, now that I'm sitting here talking, I'm like, wait a minute, I did not ask them how people who are, you know, who do not have as much money as other people have access to that, but they have invited us back. So I'm gonna write that question down. I'm gonna hit them with that uh, next time. But, and I see that Taya has like put this beautiful picture up. It doesn't quite look like that before. Um, we were wearing vests and hard hats and clothes shoes and pants, the whole, the whole thing. And it's still very much under construction, uh, but it's expected to be finished pretty quickly, like in a couple of months, like early mm -hmm. next year, I believe. So pretty exciting and it was great. Thank you so much. I wish I could have been there next time. Okay, so very briefly, I have a few other items to report. Um, our, our chair, Lenny Singletary, ha has uh, stated that he will announce a new co-chairs and new members soon. So we're uh, looking forward to getting a co-chair and hopefully some new members soon. So keep, keep your eyes open for that. Um, last month, we had a very good presentation from Los Soros uh, for the wraparound services for multi-agency involved young people in Farragut and Whitman. And we were able to connect them with the leadership at District 13, uh, the social work and guidance and attendance uh, leadership in the district through the district superintendents. And they met. Um, and we heard they had a very fruitful meeting and they'll be able to refer students and follow up with students. And that's the type of thing that although we don't have actions often that, that have to be voted on by the full board, I think that's like a major contribution if we can make connections uh, in our community. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, we plan to be uh, a few years ago, some of you remember we worked with uh, the Hess uh, program and the Bunk Association Open Airways around asthma. Um, and there's a new person uh, working on that asthma initiative with the Bunk Association. Uh, and we will be meeting jointly with the Hess committee and really trying to follow up to make sure that the young people in our schools have access to open airways to nurses administering medication in school and the other aspects that can support attendance uh, for students with asthma. So again, that's gonna be happening. Talking about health, each month I tell you our health fair is coming up June 10th. I did a walk through with that committee that's planning it at the Commodore Barry Park, the part of the park near North Elliott and yeah, and we looked at where the tables would be and the panel and uh, all of that. So I'm asking each of you to support our efforts. You can help by um, helping with the setup in the morning. There's like tables and chairs that have to be um, put out. So that would be nine, 10 in the morning. There's also a breakdown at four. But I personally would love support. We're going to be giving away 200 books from the Brooklyn Book Bodega to uh, students, to young people and families. So I'll be sitting at a table and I will need a break from time to time. So if you want to sit with me and chat or you want to let me go for a walk and you can man or a person or woman the table, that would be great. Uh, we'll be giving the fair goes from 11 to 4. And we have tents apparently, so hopefully we don't get heat stroke. And there's a rain date, I believe two weeks after in case it's a rainy day. 
And I heard that Nick is going to be taking pictures. And I'm very fussy how I look in a picture. So you don't have to take a picture. OK. Um, we were contacted by the Brooklyn Public Library. If you remember Kate Savage, the uh, librarian at Adams Street, she, she's moving on. But she is asking that any of us individually, uh, and I'll send you an email to this, that they're working with a library consultant to do a study of how useful the uh, public, Brooklyn Public Library calendar on their website is. And I know that Ellis, you know, talks about like not everyone has a computer or how you find out about things. So I will send each of you. So at first I thought this was something we had to do as a committee to give them uh, feedback, how to make their calendar better, more useful. Think about who our, you know, populations are, who we work with, but apparently it's individual. So I will send you the link and, you know, I hope that you can participate. The person that you'd be speaking to would say online, like focus, well, no, it's telephone. I think this person will be talking to you on telephone. It isn't a survey that you would fill out. It sounds like it's more of a focus group. I'm not 100% sure, but it's to really help the consultant understand how people use that calendar. If any of you use it or try to use it, or even if you don't, like what do people need so that if they go online to Brooklyn Public Library, how can they get the information they need about the calendar? So um, I will send that to you. And lastly, uh, I know that every so often when we do our yearly statement of district needs, that the issue of the Farragut Community Center tends to come up and we're not sure what's going on. And actually when I visited some of our schools, uh, earlier this month, the secretaries, the parent coordinators, and the school safety agents, they know so much. They often live in the neighborhood and so on. And, and some of them said, oh, yes, there's a cornerstone program there. And they reach out and they work with young people uh, and they have a full program. Now, I, I think we should invite them in the future or maybe go on a field visit because if it needs physical improvements to the space, maybe that's something we can advocate for. So is that something people are interested in? Maybe. Nick, Nick says yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I see Samantha's hand is up. Sam. Yeah, just a uh, update on BCS. Uh, is that Cornerstone provider, is the service provider for the Cornerstone. Um, so that's the nonprofit. Um, they have had some repairs into their gym, which was something that I think you mentioned a ways back. Um, so mm -hmm. they have had some simple improvements, but I do want to reemphasize they are in need of support. Um, as a lot of things are changing, they may or may not have the same amount of young people. Um, and they are nestled between the Boys and Girls Club 287 and 307. And also just an FYI, just so folk would know, BCS is also the nonprofit that is running the Lori Cumbo Enrichment Center, which helps, um, which is doing the younger age population, which actually are also having conversation about utilizing their space a little bit more. So if we were to speak with BCS, um, I think both of those locations would be great to have a conversation about. So to have a conversation with BCS about Farragut and also you're saying they work with some of the schools in that area? So to so, invite yeah. the schools? No, I was saying for that nonprofit to have a conversation with us or vice versa, obviously, to discuss their two programs that are inside of the district, one being the uh, elementary, uh, excuse me, the after school program and the Cornerstone, but also on Myrtle Avenue, the old daycare center that used to be on um, Prince Street, which is now directly on Myrtle, which is labeled the Lori Cumbo Enrichment Center that has been opened. I don't know if we've had a conversation with them um, and mm. their directors there. So that would be a great way to bring both of those conversations together about their programming. 
I appreciate that. That makes that makes good sense. Okay. So uh, I appreciate everybody's voice. Um, that concludes my section. So I just want to ask if anyone on the committee has committee business or other business to raise. Ellis. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I wrote this down, so I may be looking down a little bit when I, when I do this part. Um, I, at the last meeting, Betty asked us to start thinking about our statement of district needs. And um, of course, my mind immediately went to the libraries in our district who meet the needs of our children, adults, and seniors through innovative and super local programming. They're all doing something different and it's all like meant to, um, to really meet the needs of that particular community. And then I was thinking, oh, well, I should write something about that and support that and make that even stronger. And then I was like, but what am I gonna write? And that made me realize that um, I was looking for data and we have, soft data from our librarians who come to our monthly meetings and tell us about what's going on and that's really cool and you know I, I walk you know I try to go to some of them periodically that helps me too but those are all soft data but I was really looking for like kind of hard data and um hold on and without that for me, without that really robust sense of the data, it's really hard to write a nice, juicy statement of need. And actually, Betty, you just reminded me, the other thing that I, uh, I've been really thinking about quite a bit is asthma, right? That, when that principal came from, I think it was, was the principal or someone else from that school from 287? 287, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they showed like how the schools near the BQE have higher rates of asthma, which lead to all kinds of other stuff. So to me, that needs to be another statement of need, right? So for me, libraries and asthma. And, but I don't have enough data. And I don't, I have a question after all of this. I was wondering if it would make sense for our agendas for next year um, to have the data for our district guide the selection of the topics. I know there's still going to be people that want to come and speak and blah, 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 but to have for us to be thinking about what are the data of our district? What do we need to understand to be effective advocates for our community? That was it. I appreciate that. That's very well articulated. Um, maybe people can think about what data sources we should be looking at because data is a very large and amorphous um, item. So what sources should we be looking at? The Citizens Committee for Children has a lot of data uh, and We've had them over the years a few times, and unfortunately, our, our district always is kind of in the middle of most of their data points citywide because we have great wealth and great poverty. We have, and it, when it all averages out, we come out kind of average. Um, so I would suggest looking at the citizens' um, Committee for Children, they have a report every year. I, I think they sent a hard copy to the district office. I know Taya has had it in the past, but it's online and maybe we could look at that. And if people have other um, sources, uh, let's share, let's start talking about it uh, next month. Um, I, the asthma discussion will be in September or October. But in the meantime, we can try to ask, like if we know specific questions to ask about asthma, I can send it off to um, the, the person who coordinates that for the 
American Lung Association Open Airways Program. When I spoke to her, she didn't really have specifics of neighborhoods, but I tried to understand where, my question was, where in our district are there nurses who were trained in asthma? Like the school nurses have to be trained in this open airway program. And then I found out there can be a medication that's given if the, the right forms are filled out. They even have stock medications there that the parents don't need to pay for, but the nurse can administer some medication. So there's a lot to um, delve into here, but I think we need to know what schools are involved with it and make sure that the superintendent is aware that these are the schools that have the asthma programs and maybe there are other schools that need that program. So, so I like your approach, yeah. Um, anyone else, a member of the community or a member of our committee have any additional comments, questions, statements? Nick is smiling. Taya says, aversion. What is Taya saying? Let's see. Sorry, Betty, I just didn't want to interrupt you. I'll read it. Um, a version of this very good question that Ellis is raising has come up in other committees. Um, when I think about it, I think two things. One, I can't wait to have more staff to help you with this research. Um, three things. One, we need more staff to work on research like this over the summer. Two, um, this might be a very good candidate for a Fund for the City of New York Research Fellow. We get a grad student every year. The timing is kind of awkward. Um, because essentially the, the way their calendar works, we could ask them to start on a research project to feed the FY26 statement of needs, right? Um, so it has to be long-term things that we work on them with. But the third one is that any board member, and, and I know that every single board member comes to the community board with something of burning interest to them, something that they are extremely concerned about in the community. Um, and frankly, it doesn't even have to be within this committee, right? It could be across any of our six working committees. Um, I think what, if we distill it down, it's really the reason that so many uh, requests get rejected in our annual statement of needs is because they are either too broad, as in they're citywide instead of district specific, or they are too vague or some combination of both. So the most important question I've been able to figure out is what program exists in the district, which city agency is it sponsored by, and how would you like to phrase a funding request? If everybody on the board did one of those, I think we'd have a better annual statement of needs than we've ever had. If, if I could just piggyback off of that maybe, and and kind of what Ellis is maybe alluding to too. I'm, I'm wondering out loud if in the future of presentations, we could ask folks to, sh to, you know, include data, you know, any data that they have or see fit and, and maybe lean in on, you know, data that demonstrates some success in something that they want support with, growing, expanding, continuing. Um, you know, like we've had the schools come often and it's nice to hear some of what they're doing, but it's usually just some PowerPoints and I'm not hearing outcomes, not hearing successes. And maybe that's just a way to get some of that research maybe that's already done and, and we could decide if it's something worth, um, you know, putting ourselves behind and, and elevating. So just an idea. Could I respond to that? Oh, where did Betty go? Did we lose Betty? <laughs> well, let me at least bring my face back. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Did we lose Betty? Um, Nick, Maybe? I'm glad yes. you brought that up because there's two things. And, I, and I, I'm not saying this is bad. I just, that is a passive approach, right? That's waiting for people to tell us what their problems are. And I guess what I'm suggesting is we could take an active approach, right? Like, and again, I want to emphasize, 
if you are passionate about something that has nothing to do with youth education or cultural affairs, that's okay because it's not a committee statement of district needs. It's a board statement of district needs, right? And the board votes across all the committees, right? So I think when, when organizations come to us, it's because they need marketing, they need promotion, right? They don't always think of us as funding because we don't have a funding source, although we can advocate for it. So I would, I would maybe recommend rather than waiting for organizations to appear with data for us, maybe we go the other way around. What are we passionate about? And how do we find out how much money they need? Even just a dollar amount would be specific enough. Um, actually, Nicholas, would you mind taking over since I think we might have lost Betty? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I, I <laughs> guess. Sure. Would any, any, anyone else like to uh, share anything? Samantha, I think did I see you in the chat. You, you brought up uh, questions also being asked around the BQE conversation. Do you want to expand on that? Oh, no, we've lost everybody. Somebody call. All right. <laughs> I mean, I have my hand up for a question. Oh, I'm I sorry. Also yeah. Ellis has her hand up. Is she able to speak? Go ahead, Melinda. Okay. So, Taya, can you provide us with an example of, um, of a statement of need for the board? Um, if you know of what other boards have done, um, that would be helpful. Or just one, one example if you have it. It doesn't have to be applicable to this year. I just want to know what it would sound like or what it would look like. I hear you, Melinda. Totally fair question for a first year board member. Um, there is actually an archive of all of the previous statements of district need. I mean, we, we have all of ours going back to, I think, 2002. Um, but this year was a little bit different. This was the first year that DCP published the agency responses to our requests right alongside the request. Usually we have to wait for a couple months to get that and then put it together. But this is the first time it's together. And I think that's powerful because that is public information. So the agencies can't be lazy in their responses, right? So I will be, Melinda, I will be sure to share that with you before your final meeting in June. Um, and further, I think for your June meeting, it would be appropriate. I'll just pull up all of the requests that are germane to youth education or cultural affairs so that you can review them um, not to encourage you to re-request things you've already requested in the past, but just as an example of things, new ideas you could have going forward. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, and so Ellis, Ellis, you had your hand up. Did you have another question or want to make a comment? You know, I'm, I know I'm a little bit, uh, uh, <clears throat> outspoken and uh, I don't hold back. And I have like, I have, my passion is the library um, because I feel it kind of, you know, it includes everything or, or, or much of the work that our committee is doing, but you know, in its own little bucket there, its own little library bucket. And I am really, really stuck on the asthma thing as well. Um, and because I think that we, our district has a particular need in a particular area of the district that we can actually give voice to. Um, but I realized that I am not an arts person at all. And I want to acknowledge that. And I just want to say like, hello, art people. Um, you know, don't let me be the only one speaking up here. And that's all I want to say. <laughs> We, I, we, I'd maybe go in cycles. I know when I first joined, there was, um, there was definitely maybe more representatives. It felt like um, from the arts. We get a little, little e heavy right now. <laughs> Why e? 
All right. So I think, uh, Tay, you're going to help me out, but I think now is this where I ask opening it up to the public if anybody would like to share besides board members, just anybody, any news or information for us? Sorry, I was typing on, uh, more to Melinda. Uh, yes, it is Open Community Forum. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I... Okay, I don't, hearing none. I think that is the all of the business. So do we Actually, have a... Yeah. No, yes, what am I missing? I don't have an agenda and literally- well, Melinda's question was really good and I promise I'll be super quick. I just wanted, I just <laughs> no, wanted- No, go, please. I just wanna share this. Please um, bookmark this link that I just stuck in the chat and I'm just gonna show you what it is super quick. Um, Melinda, I think you're the first person to ask me, <laughs> what have the other community boards said about it? Because I think it's easy to forget that, you know, we're one of 59 community districts, right? Um, so there is, an, there is a single source place to find every other community district's annual CD needs. Here's how you find it. So this is the map um, of all 59 community districts. Um, and if you, I'll use ours as an example. If you click on Brooklyn 2, um, if you click on the community board tab within each community district, you'll see the three most recent community district needs. I love this question so much because I think I really encourage you all, especially like look at our neighboring. I mean, of course, we're going to have a lot in common with six, eight, three, and one. I, I talk to those district managers in those four districts almost daily. We have a lot in common with them. We have overlapping service districts. We have overlapping school districts, et cetera. So like here's BK6. If you click on community board, you can see there are three most recent community district needs. Um, I love that question so much, Melinda, that I'm gonna make sure that the board is aware of this. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you, Taya. You've done a lot of work over the yeah. years helping us helping us think through this and, yeah. and do better. <laughs> Okay, so any other questions or comments before we entertain a motion to adjourn? Okay, not hearing any, so motion to adjourn for the evening. Seconded. Okay, I see Samantha, it was that right? And Rachel, did I get that Yep. right? All right, thank you. So that is 7.33. Thank you all so much for participating. And I apologize for having to take over at the last minute. Um, hopefully Betty's doing all right. Thank you all, have a have Bye, an awesome everyone. evening. Thank you.